So Avani, would you take it away? Thank you. I just want to say it's so moving, Angie, to have you here, uh, for you to be the bridge into the film and into our discussion now. Uh, I was so moved by the film. Um, and so I'm just curious, you know, I wish we could see everybody because we have over 70 people here with us. And so I just want to welcome everybody's opinion. So this is really about getting together in community. I think what stood out to me the most was this final image of you, Angie, going into your grief with community. I think this is one of the big missing pieces around all of these challenges that each person is alone with that. And that just shouldn't be like that. So I think the, the film ends with this really beautiful idea of like, we need to bring this back into the community. And so that's why I'm so happy that we're all together here. And so um, should we go around and just say who we are on the panel? Would that be a good idea? Okay, so I'm gonna start. My name is Avani. I started a nonprofit, Natural Highs, uh, healthy alternatives to drugs and alcohol because I had worked in the system around substance abuse and mental health for years. And I just saw that what we were doing wasn't working that well. And I felt we need to bring a different perspective, like an empowerment lens to this whole situation. And so in Natural Highs, at this point, we don't consider ourselves treatment. We consider ourselves a leadership and peer mentor program because we think everybody carries wisdom around these issues wherever you are and everybody should be teaching other people. So that's why I'm here tonight. I'm very passionate about all of these topics. And so I'm going to give it to Dee. I'm going to pass it to you. Hi, I'm Dee. So I am a naturalized peer mentor and also I serve with AmeriCorps right now in New Hampshire. Um, I guess I'm kind of on this panel today because I have definitely had my share of and continue to have like mental struggles with that department. Um, and I was on medication. Um, I got on medication when I was like 14, I want to say. And I was on... Um, like I had a whole journey with like trying out so many different types and like all this stuff, you know, the classic, gotta start out with Zoloft and see what happens from there. Um, and I was basically like, um, I mean, if someone wants to ask, they can, I can give more details, but I was on um, some heavy shit for like three years, like during like my early teen years. Um, and it really fucked me. <laughs> So, um, and Avani knows that because I was kind of like with natural highs when I was getting off, um, when I got off, which I'm completely off now, which is good. Um, so that's why I'm on the panel today, just because I'm a natural highs person and I have experience with this. So yeah, and um, I'm really happy to be here. That documentary was really good. <laughs> and then- Do you say um, something about being, uh, what, what it means uh, for you to be an Accu Detox provider? I think that is super relevant okay. for tonight. Yes, um, so I'm an ADS member, so I am um, NADA Accu Detox trained. Um, so it basically means um, I'm trained in this specific, um, I'm, I'm an Accu Detox specialist, so it's this type of um, acupuncture based. Um, I'm really trying to pick my words specifically <laughs> um, because it's not like acupuncture really legally um but it's five sites in the ear and it's just this really really amazing treatment that um it was actually created to help with like drug withdrawal but it does so much more than that it alleviates physical symptoms so many mental symptoms and like it's like for withdrawal in general so it could obviously like really help with um getting off meds I didn't really have it when I was getting off my meds which um I think it'd be super helpful but um I still use it day to day like um I used it actually just like two days ago when I wasn't feeling super well um you can do it on yourself you can do it on others and it's just five really small needles it's absolutely amazing um I know that probably a lot of people on the, um, um on right now are from Colorado and I know that there's like a lot of like uh resources there to get um not a treatments in Colorado so I really recommend that um yeah <laughs> pass it on to Jess Sarah hi I'm Jazz I am also a peer mentor with natural highs I have been 
what is it? I, I think I mentioned this in the beginning, but I've, um, I've been with this program for about almost a decade. Um, and I was really wanting to come onto this panel because I think that I have a balanced pers perspective of medication um, and I'm really privileged to. And I'd like to acknowledge like the intellectual privilege I had there. The first time I was put into a mental hospital was when I was 13. Um, I was having hallucinations because I was sleeping like one day a week, um, which is like totally normal. That's a normal thing to happen. If you don't sleep, you're going to see things. Um, you're going to hear things. You're going to have a bad time. And fortunately, my parents are hippies, so they were super anti-medication. And that had its downsides for sure. Um, you know, never being able to go to the hospital kind of sucked. But uh, it also meant that when I was 13 and in the hospital and they wanted to put me on lithium for psychosis at 13, that they were like, fuck no, we're not allowing it. Like my daughter cannot, like, we're not gonna do that. Um, I found natural highs before I ended up choosing as an adult to go on medication. And I think that's what made a huge difference in my life right? Like I had access to trauma release exercises and I had opportunities to become a leader, right? Someone was like, you're really good at talking to people. Um, you should stay sober so that you can keep doing that because you're really good at it. You know, now I've, I have, you know, experience working in psychiatric facilities and I'm getting my bachelor's degree at Neuroba for neuroscience and somatic psychology, right? Like I came a really long way and I don't think I would have been able to do that if I had gotten medicated when people were trying to medicate me. Um, it wasn't until years later that like when I, I think it was when I was like 20, um, that I was struggling in a way that didn't make sense to me. Um, but I had the privilege, you know, having known Ivani for so many years and having access to information and knowing how harmful the lack of informed consent can be. I actually showed up to my first psychiatrist with a, with a packet printed out of the three different medications that I found that would be probably acceptable for what I was going through. <laughs> um, which is kind of how I approach things in general, but, uh, I'm really upset that I am like part of that like small 20%, right? Like I am part of that small 20% and it's because of my privilege and where I come from and the kind of communities I was exposed to. Um, so I'm really grateful to be here. And I am not AccuDetox trained, but I do wanna mention that uh, how it kind of originated in America was through the Black Panther movement. Um, and they were using it because there's so many um, people dying from drugs and also so much stress and what was going on in that time. So a little, little shout out um, to that. Thank you. Perfect, so pass it on to Aaron. It's yours, Aaron, you can have it. Thanks, Jazz. Uh, my name is Aaron Huey. I began taking Ritalin when I was eight years old, diagnosed with uh, ADHD as a young kid. Uh, growing up, I developed a pretty intense drug addiction with marijuana and LSD being my drugs of choice, uh, switching to alcohol, uh, toxic relationships, and then food. And ultimately, in my recovery, I realized that the problem was Aaron and started actually dealing with the problem. Uh, through dealing with the problem of Aaron, I uh, founded a treatment center for children, a mental health and dependency treatment center. Um, and through that, uh, to, to really begin an outreach, uh, created a podcast called Beyond Risk and Back that is for parents of teenagers and children who are struggling. Uh, and it's I've been riding a wonderful wave internationally with an audience. Our treatment center is very successful with an 89% success rate, whereas most adolescent treatment centers have an 89% failure rate. We attribute our success, A, to our family intervention program, and B, to our holistic. We do employ, I do employ psychiatrists, uh, so we do use Western medications, uh, but we are also very uh, uh, aware and connected 
connected to proper nutrition, supplements, uh, vitamins, uh, exercise. We are connected, and I have known Avani for many, many years. Avani, it's like 25 years now that we have been colleagues. I've been a bouncer at their Sober Rave events uh, for, for many years with a good friend. And through all this, got to meet Angie and have watched the documentary a few times now. And about the documentary, I'm just going to go ahead and say, I'm not crying, you're crying. And that the, the experience of the documentary has also set me into now a four-part podcast series about medicating children and featuring Angie and Medicating Normal as a significant, uh, not just catalyst for the documentary of the pod doc, but also to just really explore and provide as many solutions for parents who are having to ask themselves the question, do I need to medicate my child? And my final interview was yesterday where I interviewed my own mother about her experience of putting me on Ritalin at eight years old. Um, and it's been a phenomenal journey. So Angie, thank you so much for your work and you being a catalyst uh, uh, for this wait. experience. Listen, oh, that's oh, amazing, the, Aaron. The, what that's I've great. discovered through this and, and working with you and the director has been phenomenal. So thank you for having me on this panel. Um, and my specialty is parenting teens that struggle and running a treatment center and a podcast to support families. Thank you all so much. We have so many great questions. I'm going to just piggyback off of what you just said, Aaron, to kind of, because it's all in that, in that realm. So this question is from a person asking, what can parents do when their children need support, yet the pediatrician is recommending this type of mainstream standard care? Most parents are afraid to challenge the pediatrician or don't know where else to go. But a second part of that from the teen, for the teens on the panel, what is it like from you as a teen being put on medication? Can you talk about that too? So we got everybody talking. So who wants to go first? I'll start uh, uh, first and then uh, absolutely would love to it because, because so much of every single interview I did for this podcast series, this pod doc series, uh, ended with that question, what, what do we need to tell parents? And every single answer from, from the doctors, from the therapists, from the psychologists themselves, from the parents who've been through this and from their children who have been med is fight for your child, be their number one advocate, be like, be like Jasmine and show up with the stack of paperwork because the insurance companies are not going to, the, uh, uh, the, the pharma companies are not going to, the doctors do not have the time for you. And that leaves you and the government. And the government, we, we know who's, who's filling their pockets. So mom and dad, it's you. And I'm sorry, I know you've been under so much stress and tension and pressure. Take this one on otherwise your kid's going to end up on something and it's going to make it worse. Go in armed, go in advocating and get a second, third and fourth opinion. Never stop at the first one. I'll pass that from there. Yeah. And we started an initiative called how to turn anxiety into your superpower. So I think one of the biggest issues at this point is that people really misunderstand emotions and misunderstand anxiety and misunderstand trauma and misread it as a disorder, right? And of course, we saw in the film that there's vested interest in that, why a lot of people want us to believe that and why there's lots of advertisement for that idea. And so we educate parents and kids and professionals around that anxiety, for example, is a symptom of overwhelm and that it's not unhealthy, it's not wrong, it's a signal in your system that you can actually work with, right? So we literally teach the neuroscience of trauma, of anxiety, to help people understand that this is not something that needs to be band-aided or that needs a medication, but this is a healthy reaction and how you can channel it to help kids and adults and parents through it. I, I wanna say really quick, Dr. Cass, I see you in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Cass, your book is 
a standard required reading for all of our staff in our facility. I probably have 60 copies of your book in our facility. I know of Vani because uh, because we were our facility works very uh, closely with Avani. So thank you for being here. Your work is tremendously uh, impactful on our treatment center. So thank you very much, Dr. Cass. I would love to interview on the podcast, by the way. And the name of her book is Natural Highs for everybody watching if you if you want to know. OK, so it's to the teen perspective. Talk about, you know, what it was like to be put on medication as a teen or, and, or off or, you know, talk about that a little bit. B, do you want to do you want to hit this one up? Sure. Um, going off on like the whole like parenting part, um, I guess my situation was like pretty different from that. Um, I was kind of the person who like really, really took the initiative with um, getting on medication. Like I come from a like different cultural background. Like my parents are both Hispanic and also Asian, so like medication or just mental health is just like not a thing that you discuss at all. I remember for like a year or two, I was like, I'm really depressed. I'm really anxious. I'm not doing well. My parent, my mom was like, okay, go eat a banana and get some sunlight. Like, what are you doing? Like, and like not in like a bad way, but just like a part of like, she just did not get it. Um, and it actually wasn't until she noticed that I was self-harming that she was like, oh, you were like for real. <laughs> I was like, yeah. So um, I, it was weird. I kind of had to like beg her to like, kind of like give me, I was scared of myself, honestly. Um, so I started, um, like we went to like our regular doctor health provider and they were like, yeah, go to a psychiatrist. Cause like you're all kinds of messed up. And I was like, this is cool, awesome, really awesome. <laughs> so I went to a therapist, went through a couple therapists. Some of them were really bad and, um, I eventually got on meds and we started meeting with a psychiatrist who was a little bit the worst like he was like like obviously like he had like a very obvious like racist undertone to his voice all the time and I didn't like the way he spoke to my mom but my mom had like researched him and he was all like apparently like one of the best in the area we went all the way to Littleton from Westminster to see him in Colorado so it was like a whole thing um and so I went for depression so I thought I was being put on antidepressants, but um, he cutely put me on antipsychotics and didn't tell us. <laughs> um, so I was on Respiridon when I was like 14 for three years. I was like on a really high dose. I was on phenlethaxine and Respiridon, so antidepressant and antipsychotic at the same time, which was cool. He also like put me on Respiridon and like told me I could take it in the morning and it's sedative. So I was passing out in class. And when I told him what happened, he was like, oh yeah, that's because it's sedative. I was like, cool, thanks for letting me know I'm failing my AM class. Um, so that was ideal. Um, but yeah, I, so it was kind of a weird situation because it was like, it wasn't really my parents. I think like my mom's, my dad was just not, he's not in the picture. And my mom, like, obviously like there's a little bit, she speaks English, but there's a little bit of a language barrier, um, especially because he would talk so fast and he'd use big words. So she was like trying to be really involved with my medication process, but she wasn't really completely able to. And I was like 14, so what did I know? So we kind of just did whatever he wanted to my brain and we didn't really even know what he was doing. And we were like, okay, cool. Um, In hindsight, do you think that was of your best interest to, to go through that like that? Was it positive experience and negative experience? You know, I will never say that I regret being on meds. Um, I think that to some degree, it did provide some sense of stability for me. Um, I was just like off the charts, like not like grasping for something to help me, but I don't know how much they did because it was a combination of therapy. And then obviously like my parents, my, well, my mom starting to kind of understand where I was going. So it's kind of like how the documentary was saying too, it's like, I don't know how much the meds actually did. I do know that I'm alive. So I want to say that they did something, um, but the withdrawal was, I, I can't even explain. It was terrible, so brutal. Um, almost killed me in itself, honestly. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can I piggyback on that? Yeah, your turn, Jess. <laughs> um, yeah, about the withdrawals. So I mentioned that I wasn't, fortunately, I had parents who were really understanding. Um, even just sitting here, I was like, oh my God, wait, I went on trazodone when I was 13. Um, 
I've been on trazodone since I was 13. I'm 22. Uh, and I've gotten off of it at times, but, um, full disclosure, like I, I like cannot get off of it at this point in my life without help. Uh, that's like a place that I'm at right now. And like, because fortunately I didn't experience too many side effects from it being on it this long, but when I did finally reach out to go get medicated, it was because I, a a really awesome therapist that I had had, had been like, okay, you've been like having these weird mood swings where you'll be depressed for like a month. And then all of a sudden you're like on top of the world. Um, That's a little way. And she was holistic even. She was like a very understanding woman. Um, I was diagnosed with bipolar. It's a diagnosis that it's helpful to me in that um, I didn't feel like I was crazy anymore, but, um, the first medication that I tried, I told my doctor that I was on trazodone and maybe he just didn't know, but he put me on Effexor and I was also on trazodone, which are two antidepressants. And if you're someone with bipolar, that will like send you directly into mania. And I almost jumped off a roof. I was walking on, on, in the mall with my ex-partner and um, my friend, his aunt. Uh, and I literally just like, was walking behind them and in two seconds completely switched off and I just walked walked right on up there and I was standing on the edge of the parking garage and I was like how did I get here literally how did I get here um and I think that's even the scarier part is like even though I walked in with a packet of things that I knew that I could handle that I'd done research on and I gave this doctor all the information he could have possibly needed about me, he still missed like that one like crucial fact. Um, It took me about a year to finally get on the right medication. Um, And I take a very low dosage of something that helps me with the depressive episodes. But like, that was horrifying. It was horrifying. And I know personally, a lot of my friends who have not survived going up to the top of the roof right? Like I lost my best friend in high school because her doctor took her off her antidepressants while she was going through a breakup. She jumped off a cliff, right? Like that, that was really challenging, but that's also the event that inspired me to get sober and get back into natural highs. Um, And I wish that we didn't have to lose people in order to like fight harder. I wish that we didn't have to. I wish that we could just be there and we didn't have to like fight this pharma driven a uh, monster entity that has become the psychiatric world. Well, I think I, th- I think there's an interesting question, right? When when somebody said, "So, how does acupuncture work?" I think this would be a good moment to talk about this. That you know, there is in our Western world right now, the idea is to just band aid the symptoms, right? To knock out the anxiety without really understanding where it's coming from or to knock out the depression without knowing that it's like an engine light in a car that is going on, that is blinking, like something is happening. And you know, what meds do is they just screw out the engine light without looking under the hood. Like, why is this actually happening? So we teach people that symptoms are actually your best friends. And like like the mother said in the film, right? It's like the canary in the minefield. Like, for you to wake up that there's something going on. Now, when we do AccuDetox, which is this beautiful protocol with five points in the ear, it really helps making people more resilient. So it's a very different approach to working with symptoms where it's not like knocking out the symptoms, but it's actually strengthening the whole organism so that you can be calmer and stronger to actually deal with what you need to deal with, right? So that idea comes from Chinese medicine where it's about, let's look at the whole organism and let's help the organism become more resilient, right? So it's very, very different. And like Dee said, right, this form of AccuDetox was developed in a neighborhood in the Bronx where people deal dealt with like trauma up the wazoo and hardcore drug use. And this form of uh, acupuncture has been shown in research to be incredibly successful in helping people with withdrawal, with trauma, 
with anxiety, with sleep problems, right? And so the question is like, why is this not more known? You know, but I tell you why, because nobody can make billions of dollars from it. It's a very low cost treatment. We do it in groups. Now in Colorado, anybody can get trained to do it. And so, you know, this could be a movement where we as people can take this back into our own hands to help each other, right? And so, um, I mean, I want everybody to to know about that, right? So I can put it in the in the um, in the chat. Uh, you can look it up, acudetox.com. You can look up in your community if a, a acupuncture community clinic is providing the NADA protocol. Any acupuncturist can look it up and can uh, can do it for you. Uh, it's super powerful, and we have Libby Stout on. Uh, who I would want to call on because Libby is uh, a really incredibly important addiction psychiatrist in our community and is also an Acu Detox trainer. So Libby, of course, lives in both worlds, right? So Libby, if it's okay with you, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Libby, can I promote you to panelist? I don't. Should I just do it? Is she, she's okay. She's aware. It's okay. Okay, here she comes. Libby, is she there? There she is. Great. You can turn your camera on if you want. There you go. Hi, Libby. <laughs> oh, we can't hear you. Hey, nope. Libby, we can't hear you. Let's you are that. unmuted, but we can't hear you. Okay, try now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Okay. I was just saying that was an that is an awesome movie. Awesome. I'm really impressed, and uh, I, this is something I've been doing forever. I I mean I'm a psychiatrist, but I always tell people I'm not a very good one because I try not to prescribe medication, and I try and get people off medication. So that's I, the I, best I, kind, Libby. That's the <laughs> best kind. <laughs> So I, um, yeah, I, for the last 20 years, I've been the medical director for a treatment program in Colorado that's awesome. The, it's funded by the state of Colorado. It's called the Circle Program. It's a 90-day inpatient treatment program for people who have failed everything else, basically. And so most people are there as a condition of some kind of legal problem. Uh, and so we've had, you know, lots of veterans go through that program as well. And most of my life, I've been taking people off meds and it, it is uh, so gratifying. To, and it was a 90 day program. So we actually had time to actually do that. But that's where I found that Detox can really help with that a lot. Uh, and, and so, you know, this is, this is something the, the NADA organization, we're now working with the VA to get this into the VA as a really active treatment because it, when people are feeling these normal emotions, you know, they're scared, I mean, they're normal, but yes, your central nervous system is all out of control. And this is a really awesome way to help calm that down like immediately without any side effects. And it's, you know, it's acupuncture, our whole idea is to heal from the inside out. And so when you do the acudetox training, you learn about, the only diagnosis you have to learn about is called empty fire, if that's a Chinese diagnosis. And, and basically it's what it is, is instead of what we do in Western medicine is we try to put out the fire. So we throw on all kinds of drugs. This is to heal you from the inside out. And so it's pretty, pretty amazing. And I just wonder how we can get more people to see this movie um, because, uh, I work at a FQHC, so primary care facility where I'm the psychiatrist. And basically, I'm not starting anybody on anything. I see people and I say, okay, let's see if we can start working on getting you off these meds. And people are really wedded to their medication. That's kind of, it's a difficult sell. But my most hated meds are benzos. And 
And I just wish, I, I do a lot of education for medical students and residents, and I try and educate them about the fact that yes, they're awesome drugs, they work immediately, but you should never use them longer than two to four weeks, never ever. And uh, it's just hard to convince people of that. So thank you for the movie, thank you. Thank you for coming, Libby. I have a question. Uh, this is kind of an experiment. I just want to do an experiment with you all, if you mind, if you don't mind, <laughs> because there's a lot of questions in the chat about withdrawal, about like how fast, about tapering support. So I just want to take a poll of just the panelists. Please tell me in two sentences or less what you know about how fast a person can come off of a psychiatric drug. Uh, so if you think a person should be tapered in six months or in two weeks or you skip a pill, like tell me what you know in like two sentences or less. I just want to see the varying opinions of just our panel. I think Libby should start because she's a doctor, so. No, she's going to give the answer and then everybody, no, it's okay. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> Libby goes last. Okay, D, like D, what do you know about antidepressant withdrawal? How long should that take or what have you been told? before watching this movie? Um, well, I, well, all my knowledge is how I did it and I didn't do it well. So um, I don't know, maybe like, well, it's obviously like depends on the certain med and the dosage, but like maybe like five, four months, five months. Okay, Jazz, Jazz, what about you? What uh, do you know? I uh, yeah, I was told um, that even cutting down like an entire dosage can be really dangerous, but um, either a third of a dosage to a dosage should take about two months. And that's like for every co-occurring um, dosage thereafter. So I would then at that point probably guess between like six to eight months, like full, like full getting off of something, um, being able to manage uh, normal human being symptoms again. And what about you, Aaron? Like your facility? What do you guys generally You know, do? yeah, the, uh, what a great question because A, um, not being a doctor, but being someone who took uh, my own sweet time getting off as many meds as possible, the withdrawal recovery process, it, it, it lasts years. And, and having to go through the different stages of feeling and finding yourself slipping back and the illness that comes up and the body pains that reemerge and the old behaviors and patterns that reemerge. I believe with our adolescence, we see the beginnings, just the glimmers of, I'll just use the term sobriety in the first four months, but it's just the beginning. The change is easy. Main, maintenance of change is the lifelong work. So our goals here is not just say, great, you're off it and you're done and you're good forever. It's like, now that we got this started and you can make choice, choices from the prefrontal cortex, the conscious brain, let's see if we can create consciousness consciousness around what's going on in your body as this stuff is coming out. So I'm going to say minimum, minimum, the beginning is about four months long, but I'm 22 years sober and was in Florida two weeks ago and wanted to use so badly, but I knew I was eating more wheat. So it's, it's too, it's, it's too much of a, uh, a convoluted subject to, for me to give a, a clear answer for a parent to rely on. Avani, what do you think? So I work as a substance abuse counselor and trauma therapist. And so I work a lot with people where the whole picture got very complicated because oftentimes when people take psychiatric medications, they also oftentimes use substances, right? And what we have figured out is that often, you know, they kind of like uh, kind of keep each other um stuck, you know, so where we have seen people who have been prescribed Adderall and then developed a substance use problem on top of that, trying to calm themselves down, right, like with alcohol or THC. And then we have seen people that were prescribed antipsychotics like Seroquel for sleep and then developed this incredible craving for methamphetamine, right? So, uh, so when I help people get off a drug, substance use, it often becomes apparent that actually the psychiatric medication is kind of linked into that and keeps the substance abuse in place. So sometimes then people make the decision, you know, to work on getting off the whole shebang. And 
I have to tell you, it really depends on the person because the symptom of the withdrawal can be so debilitating that people can function, right? So I always would say it's typically longer in a slower taper than their doctor advises. We just know that from experience. And what I would say when people look for real, like immediate support, I have seen uh, that the online survivor support groups are phenomenal. You know, like the benzo withdrawal support groups on Facebook, on Reddit. I highly recommend that because people find a community there where they feel like they're not going crazy or it's not their personal failure. And that's where people exchange a lot of experiences. So it's kind of a sad state in our culture you know, that people kind of have to organize it for themselves. But I would say the wisdom in these groups and what people do for each other is kind of outstanding. And I, I really feel the community aspect is huge. And I do think it's different for people, different people, because there is a mental health component, right? So if somebody has severe anxiety and then the withdrawal causes really severe anxiety, a person has to do that, right? It has to juggle it. But I have to say, I feel now we have more resources than ever before, right? So I think the Acu Detox is huge. Acupuncture is huge. I think nutrition is absolutely huge. I think micronutrient therapy, which really we don't have a lot of research in the US, but we have research internationally. Uh, and I think we should put Hyla Cass on the panel as well. Hyla, if you are willing to do that, uh, you should speak to that because I think there are really ways how we can help people go through this process more successful, you know, and less excruciating. And I think, Erin, with what you guys do at Fire Mountain, you know, you should see the food that people get at Fire Mountain. It's like a dream. It's ideal, right? No wheat, no sugar. It's like a dream for, as, for me, right? As preaching what people should do as a recovery diet, right? How they can support their body. So I think people can really make it easier for themselves by doing the healthy things. So I don't think there's a one size fits all. Good answer. Um, it, yeah, has these different elements, right? And Libby, what do you think? Because I just want to hear you. And then I want to say what a little bit of my experience too. Go ahead. I think it's absolutely varies depending on the person, depending on the drug, depending on how long they've been on it. Um, and, and, and because with the antidepressants, for example, some are worse than others, like Effexor and, and um, is like the worst. Effexor is really, really bad uh, in terms of withdrawal. You know, Prozac, since it has such a long half-life, is not as bad, but, you know, it just depends on the person. Uh, benzodiazepines, my recommendation is it should be slow, but it shouldn't take longer than six months because then that becomes a problem in itself. But, um, yeah, it has to be really slow. And it's, you know, sometimes you have to just break the capsule up like you showed on the movie and just drop a little, drop it into something and then just take a little bit at a, peak, at a time. And yeah. So, so thank you all for participating in my experiment. I'll just share a little bit about my experience really quick, both as a patient, it took me two and a half years to taper off Cymbalta. If I went any faster, I could not breathe correctly. Mm -hmm. My physiology was so hijacked by that drug and who knows it was probably the drugs before that but over, all in all my tapering process from the time that I had the first intuition that like something was wrong to the time I was actually off of everything using a harm reduction approach under medical supervision it was a 10-year process 10 wow. years 10 years <laughs> wow. because I was put on more than 40 psychiatric drugs and all these different combinations polypharmacy nightmare didn't know which way was up completely I was considered seriously and chronically mentally ill. It's all over my records, you know, persistent mental illness. Um, it was very severe. But anyway, so now that I'm off, I help in the community, these groups that we're kind of talking about. And somebody had asked a question in the chat. I wanted to mention this, that, you know, they always say like, don't use Dr. Google, don't Google. 
let me tell you that if some of us didn't Google, we would be dead because we didn't know what was happening. So I know that the doctor says don't Google, but these groups are absolutely life saving. Um, like Avani mentioned, you know, everybody's kind of tapering together. You can bring up like I have this symptom. What is that? And a lot of people will say go to the doctor and get checked out and make sure there's nothing physically wrong with you, which and, and a lot of times psychiatrists don't even run any medical tests. So it's, it's been life-saving for a lot of people, but it, like we all just saw it's range. It ranges. Some people are cold turkeyed and they have seizures and I mean, hit their head and have a brain injury from that because doctors don't understand how slow you need to go. Other people have to taper for two years because any cut that's too much, they're completely suicidal and will jump off of a bridge. You know what I mean? And so we always say like a patient centered symptom-based taper. And it's unfortunate because there's such an opportunity here to like help people heal and help people listen to their intuition and follow and listen to your body. Like how fast should I go? But, but because the medical, you know, the medical institution has kind of left the building, it's left all these groups to kind of support each other. But maybe that's a good thing because we have all this collective wisdom of 40 years of people tapering and trying to figure it out on their own and discovering tapering techniques like you saw in the film. But, um, it's, it's a long process. I'm five years off now. I still suffer from neurological symptoms that are severe. Like I am being treated like I've had an acquired brain injury right now. I'm, I'm suffering from such severe agoraphobia. I can barely walk in a store. Like, and it's, it's a, it's a physical thing. It's not like I have anxiety. Like, look at me, I'm talking to you. I'm, I'm feeling great. I'm not anxious. It's that like my brain cannot handle the stimulus from a store, like all the fluorescent light and the colors and the people talking to you it's almost like some kind of form. I don't know. It's, it's horrific though. Um, but I don't regret it. Uh, I just urge everybody in the comments that is asking about withdrawal to check out the resource page on our website. We have tons of really high quality evidence-based things about, um, tapering things that are reviewed by pharmacists. So it's our website is medicaidnormal.com. So, okay. Thank you for participating in that. Sorry, that was so long, but also, so let's, let's move into teen suicide since that's a very, it's just been on the news the last couple of days that the pandemic and kids not going to school has, you know, increased the suicide rate. Also the prescribing rate is up 30 to 40% because of the pandemic. And I always think that's interesting because we have a clear reason why everybody is suffering from anxiety and depression. It's not a chemical imbalance. It's a clear reason. It's flavoringly obvious if you didn't know. <laughs> Can we talk a little bit about suicide, whatever you, you all want to talk about? I, I would love to, I'd love to give that. Like, first of all, our phone is ringing off the hook with, with what's going on now that we're on the, this, this end of the, this COVID experience that the, 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 the burnout of the, of isolation and the feelings that are come up and the, the resilience struggles that we have, not just kids. We can't look at the kids and be like, oh, these kids are not just resilient. We understand there's resiliency issues in teens and children, but our Gen X generation threw trophies at them and graduation ceremonies for, oh, second grade, third grade. And we are, we are diving in the way of discomfort as parents. And now as parents, our own safety, the, 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 the pure safety has been removed from us as, as, a, as a species, we, when safety was gone. So our own struggles and the trickle down effect and the lack of resilience and the isolation and on top of that developmentally children have to be away from their parents to develop self-concept so that they can question their parents' value system and they can see the teacher's value system and these other groups. And so developmentally there's things going on. So the suicide rate, the calls for depression and anxiety are, are off the chart right now. And, and our admissions team cannot keep up. Parents are terrified. Kids are at their wit's end. The, the suicide option, you know, one of the things that comes up from all of this that Angie, I think, speaks to why you guys began this documentary in the first place is that if my arm hurts so much, I can't use it. So I go to the doctor and I say, my arm hurts, I can't use it. There is no assumption made as to what's wrong. They x-ray it. They ask what happened. They try to find MOI, the, the, the mode of injury. But we go in with something going on with the, with the single most intricate organ on the planet, the human brain. And we say, my brain hurts. And they're like, here's some pills. 
and there's not the look in, there's not the x-ray, there's not the MRI, there's not very simple things like what Avani shows is this is your brain on drugs, this is your brain on weed, this is your brain on coke, this is your brain on video games, this is that these MRI scans, we're not looking, we're just tossing out something. So even with suicide, even with depression, even with anxiety, these are the fruits, these are the results, and we are not going to accomplish anything by treating if the fruit has bugs you can't spray the fruit you have to get into absolutely what's going on in the soil what's going on in the sun what's going on in the roots of the issue and so reacting to the results of teen suicide is not going to change anything speakers will show up to schools the same old song and dance talk will be given and we'll be back here as soon as something stressful happens again we're still looking at the wrong issue, whether it's with drugs, with suicide, we are not looking at what's taking place in the brain. We're just band-aiding suicide. So here we are at the very end of this saying, yep, we got a treatment center for you. We got a treatment center. You tried to commit suicide three times, you've been in an acute unit, and now the psychiatrists have got you on three meds and you need to go to an acute unit, you're 14 years old, Okay, that's the pound of cure. It's expensive mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, and financially. The ounce of prevention, these free podcasts, these online support groups, watching these movies, sitting down, turning off the tech, and turning on the talk with your kids, with your family, confronting the doctors, confronting the industry, these things are free. And it's where this is all going to start. Drinking water, healthy food, movement, conscious breathing, and sleep. These are free. And those are the five things that are going to make you look at this depression, anxiety thing and say, okay, maybe it just sucks today. Maybe today, yesterday, and the five years before up until now suck. But I need to drink some water. And that's easier said than done when you're in the middle of the shit. Someone coming in and saying, put the clouds in the sun and let's go volunteer at the Humane Society. When you are dealing with depressed brain chemistry, depression is not an emotion. Depression is brain chemistry. Sad is an emotion. And you can open Christmas presents and be suffering from depression. And until we understand what depression actually is, what anxiety actually is, we're not treating it. This is not treatment. This is, I, I, and, and what we're doing is very, very expensive. The goal now is how do you keep your kids out of treatment? How do you keep your kids out? Of, and it starts with that basic five, drinking water, sleeping, eating, moving your body and conscious breathing. And if the parents aren't doing that, I would never expect a child to. Jazz, Jazz has something hot. <laughs> I was getting I was getting riled up you were inspiring me a lot uh yeah you, I feel like you would be like a good workout partner you just like, you'd be like come on boy like you got it like you're amazing um yeah that would be excellent if you ever get bored of this you know which you won't because it's what needs to be done and it's the coolest job ever um I think you could easily find a career uh being like motivational to people who are trying to get gains um moving on I wanted to talk about you just like perfectly summed up my experience in the last couple of weeks i teach at the girls academic leadership school um in denver which uh i'm teaching natural highs um we're doing an intensive course so we're taking all of the natural highs materials which is um sex love and drugs right the brain chemistry of an or of an orgasm um healthy boundaries different love languages how like weed and alcohol and nicotine, especially right now, because there's a whole jeweling problem going on. We, we have to teach all of that in a week, basically, in five days. Um, and it's really rough because we have to like just jam pack it in there. But my first class was the ninth graders and they are stuck at home. And a lot of the girls that go to this school are, you know, they have working class families. It's majority people of color. Um, it's people who usually wouldn't have access to that kind of education. It's like a fast track to college. It's a really awesome opportunity. It's an excellent school. And we were sent in as the kind of like ease into their new health ed program, which is like a much more like inclusive, informative, healthy way um, 
of informing kids about their bodies and about loving and about hardships and grief and heartbreak and sex and intimacy and all of that. Um, and we're supposed to prepare them for it. And um, of course, none of them have their cameras on, um, none of them. And the literally the first day that I taught, all I talked about was um, habits, like how habits are formed and how highways in our brain are created and that when we associate things together they tend to fire in our brains together um and i was inspired by what you mentioned about how like children can't grow like kids can't grow if they're like with their parents all the time and also if they're like unable to like move right like we're literally stuck inside um and these girls did not say a word, right? At first, the first class was so hard. They weren't saying anything until I said something about how if you're associating your computer screen with being trapped in a situation that you can't get out of, except for if you walk away, then you're going to fail and like you're not going to get credit for school. And obviously, the gals school is like a lot better at this sort of thing than most schools. But um, you know, if, if you associate your computer screen and your room with this like isolation and loneliness all the time for a year, for a year, it's been a year, like, of course, you're going to feel depressed. Of course, you're going to turn your screen off. Of course, you're not going to say anything until I like put all of my heart into be like, hey, are you understanding this material? Like, what did you take away? Do you feel safe right now? Um, and it it's sad for me to see because like, just to be fully honest, like I have a little brother and he is going through this. Like he, his mental health is trash. He's an addict. Um, he's been having like psychosis symptoms. And I say that lovingly too. Um, I know addict can sometimes not be the term people like to use. Um, me and him use it. It's something that he feels empowered by. So I just like to disclaim that. Um, but I'm, I'm watching my little brother like degrade slowly this year. And that's been really hard for me. And I've, he's never been suicidal. And this is the year that he was like, jazz, like I'm having a really hard time. Like, I just don't even know if anyone wants me here anymore because we can't talk to our friends. We can't, we can't talk to, we can't sit in a circle or go on a walk and just be like, hey man, I'm not doing so hot, right? Um, and I do think it's really important, like the basic things those girls, those 14 year old girls in that class reminded me to drink water. They didn't talk the whole time until I started talking about how I can't drink water because I like feel like I don't have time to and I get distracted. And they, the, what they started talking the minute I expressed a problem. They didn't care. Like as soon as they had the opportunity to like be kind to me or help me, that's when they chimed in. And that's what, that's like the heart and soul. They were like, hey, Jazz, drink water. I got an email after the classes ended from one of the students. She's like, we really miss you and how clumsy you are and how bad at technology you are. Remember to drink water, right? Like they're amazing. And they're left there with people saying like, take a pill. Take a pill, listen to your parents, um, you know, stay safe in the pandemic, but no one teaches you how to do that. No one teaches you how to, right? And they're all so loving. They just need to like, they don't know how to direct it inwards. Yeah, Avani. And I think you just said it, right? The ingredients, I think the missing piece right now is community. You know, we are doing outdoor classes right now because we know that the screens are just too much, right? Like kids do not experience connection on screens. So we are literally in the winter holding our natural heights classes outdoors, you know, bundled up with hot water thermoses and like blankets to create a sense of connection because we know that there's a cumulative situation right now. And I would just wanna uh, say, add a piece to the suicide. You know, everybody I work with who has suicidal ideation, there is a reason for it. There's something underneath that people really want to share and talk about. And yes, sometimes it cannot be the parent, but I, I'm getting called in now from a public school in Boulder to do trauma treatment with the students who are, you know, in the places where they cannot function at all. 
and it, we now have the treatments. That's what I, what I want to say. We now can help people who are suicidal, who have a lot of trauma, who are stuck, who don't know how to move on. We now have treatments to help people. And so I would say, take it very seriously. If somebody expresses that they're struggling with being suicidal or having anxiety, like take it seriously and, you know, help them find community and help them find spaces where they can actually move through these feelings and not just getting them, you know, band-aided. Um, I think that's, you know, I just want to add that because in my experience, when I get called in to, to people who are really struggling with very severe symptoms, there's always a reason underneath it. Like I was just working with a, a, a student who couldn't function at all in school and thought he had ADD and thought he had depression. And uh, I said, you know, I explained the whole trauma thing for him and how, you know, it feels like when you have stuck emotions, when you feel frozen. I said, so what do you think it is? And he said, when I was 12 years old, my two best friends died in a plane crash. And I haven't moved on from that moment. Like he was literally frozen in grief from that moment. And we do, did one session of brain spotting and he came out the other end and he's like, I can't believe it. I cannot believe that I was frozen for that long and that that is why I just couldn't do anything. You know, so it's like, we can do this. We, we have the tools as a community to help people. And this is why the image, Angie, of you in the film at the end, you know, with your community actually dealing with what's underneath is it was so powerful for me. It really struck me. Yeah, that's been kind of a theme that I wanted to mention, you know, that we are, the, um, the more conversations I have like this one and the, the work that I do, and even I, I didn't, this isn't really in the film, but I did out, I was an outpatient uh, therapist in my training. So I learned trauma therapy. I worked with teens and adolescents and people of color and uh, immigrants and refugees. And one thing I learned was that people have a very valid reason for how they're feeling. They might not know how to express it. They might not know how to say it. Um, but if you ask, like, like what you're saying right now, if you ask a person, like, what in your life is making you depressed? If you asked me that question, I would say, my dog is dying. I would say, I'm in a pandemic. I'm isolated. I live in an RV. It's very hard for me to get social connection. Of course, I'm going to be depressed. And when we say, like, medicating normal, we're not saying that you're not suffering because the suffering is very real. It's just that a pill is not going to fix my isolation. It might make me care less about the isolation. You know, but I think we're so centered on brain and these neurotransmitters and we don't ask the question like what is going on in your life, you know what I'm saying. There's this beautiful analogy and then I'll pass to the next person but they say like when we see a rose bush that has died, we don't yell at the rose and give it a label, we look at the fertilizer we look at the sun we look at the dirt. We look at you know does it need water, why is it so simple for us to see that, you know, with the plant. But we don't see that with human beings. So the people that I that I always met that I met in um while I was a therapist were people living in the inner city, subjected to police violence. They didn't have papers, and I would sit in these therapy meetings with you know supervisors and other therapists, and they would say, "Well, you should consider a schizophrenic diagnosis." The person is sounding really paranoid, and I'm like, "Excuse me, you're in St. Louis, Missouri. You're black. You're on papers. If you're not anxious, something is wrong." But, but it's like, we see things, we see people through this DSM-5, through all these lettered therapies that we have, we forgot how to be a human being and just sit in community, like people are saying all over the place, church, you know, just being a friend. Instead of being a friend, we're told to give people 1-800 numbers. Like, oh, I can't talk to you about suicide, call a 1-800 number. So this whole paradigm that we, that we have right now, I feel it, it, it tears us apart. It's not bringing us together. So I just wanted to mention that, but anyway. So where should we go next? I don't know. What it, let's see. How are we doing on time? I Have just got had a quick question. I had a quick, uh, just to, it was perfect timing. Someone asked if um, Aaron and Avani, if either of your programs slash, I guess Avani, I would say our pro, I don't know, um, have online resources for people who are out of state or out of country. And I figured that would be a good one since we're talking about like there are resources. Maybe we can plug those. 
Yeah, I'm happy to. So we we basically rewrote our whole website and made it a COVID resource, okay? So you guys all can come on naturalhighs.org with an S, and there are resources for teens, there are resources for parents, there are resources for adults. And a lot of the things that we do, you can access if you're not with us. And then, of course, we're trying to do still in-person human things. So if you are in the Boulder area, we do outdoor classes at when the weather at all allows on Tuesdays. Um, and so, yes, connect. And we also uh, send out email packets uh, with inspiration and tools and resources. So please sign up for our emails on naturalhighs.org. You can also connect with us on Facebook. Um, so tons of resources. And now that, you know, COVID, we are doing some of our classes even online. We're starting a class for adults and professionals in February, a seven-week course that actually people from all around the country have started to take. So you are all very welcome to check that out. And I know that, Aaron, you can access worldwide. So Aaron, you should talk about how people can find your podcast. Thank you. So the podcast is Beyond Risk and Back. Uh, you can see it at beyondriskandback.com, but you can also see it on our website, firemountainprograms.com or parenting, uh, parents of te parenting teens that struggle.com. Um, and every parent weekend that we run for the families of kids in our program is available to parents free. Uh, the podcast is free. Our executive director has a podcast called Which Way? Sherry Simmons and her mother, Jan. Um, and, and I know, Angie, you guys were on the podcast as well. Yeah, I love those two. God, what an amazing mother and daughter. Wow. Yeah, is it is it Jan has my heart. I just absolutely love that woman and and Sherry runs Fire Mountain. So so we're absolutely very fond of them. So podcasts like Which Way, Beyond Risk and Back, uh, uh Badass Sober Life, which is uh Natural Highs podcast. Um these are free. Uh every parenting technique, every technique that a therapist knows, my goal with the podcast has been able to get them on the podcast and teach parents. You have to know what those of us in the industry know. Uh, you, you've got to be able to try this stuff at home. You've got to be able to, to weed your way through the stuff. So not only is Every Parent Weekend on, on Parenting Teens That Struggle on Facebook, which is a private group, you have direct access to me. We answer, I can answer questions in video form. Um, obviously, there's coaching. There's, there's all this kind of stuff. So that is the, uh, uh, that's the things uh, that, I, that I provide right there and it's free we we've got to give this stuff for free while we while we do it um like i said the the, the treatment is expensive mentally physically emotionally spiritually and financially the pound of cure is expensive if you've got a kid at risk don't let them go beyond it you make the changes now and the changes start with the family not the child don't expect the child to change to change the house don't expect a, a pill to change it and don't expect a skill to change it expect the family to go into recovery and everybody makes the change everybody everybody goes into recovery love it yeah, and we just started recording some of our practices, right? Because we're aware not everybody can afford brain spotting therapy, not everybody can afford trauma treatment. So we started doing guided audio practices for people who are struggling and you can find them on naturalheist.org. And so for example, we made a free guided practice for frontline workers and activists in how they can move their trauma, their secondary trauma, their stress to prevent PTSD from these times, right? So feel free to go on our website, on our store and uh, look at that and get, get those things. Some of them are free. Some of, of them are for donation for our, our nonprofit, but go and find resources for yourself. It's totally worth it. So let's let's go ahead and close it out because we're at about an hour and fifteen minutes. I feel like I could talk to you all for two more hours, but <laughs> let's cut let's cut it and uh, so let's go around and say our final thoughts. Um, anything that you want to say before we close out? Something that we might have missed earlier, and then where people can find you? Any websites or book recommendations? All those things. You ready? Uh, I know you kind of already did, but D and Jazz and Libby. 
final thoughts? Does that mean I go first? Yeah, you go. Go ahead. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm like half asleep because of the time difference. Um, but yes, I was just really honored to be on this panel today. And as I said earlier, the documentary was very interesting. It was good to meet everyone. Um, I guess just like the conclusion is just like, be careful and like, like I'd say, like probably question everything. Obviously do your own research as hard as that is because obviously some information can be biased or convoluted for some sort. But yeah, just um, think about all your choices, think about them long-term um, and yeah, do natural high stuff. <laughs> Perfect. Jazz or Libby? Okay, it's me. Um... <laughs> I'm on the spectrum. I have to sometimes like really like closely observe people <laughs> to like understand when they're gonna talk. Um, hi, yeah, Angie, thank you so much for having us. Um, I cried. Uh, it is me and it's you crying. We're all crying. <laughs> um, it really was that image of you um, crying and being held by so many people. I'm taking that away and I'm really grateful for that, really. Um, as someone who like oftentimes can't reach out for help because I'm like an overachiever and I like am the one who's helping people. Um, that was really inspiring. Just seeing you now and then also seeing you so vulnerable and like powerful um, makes my heart Thanks, feel good. Jenna. Yeah. Nice hug. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, and to everyone that came, it's really awesome that y'all are here. Um, and yes, I put all of the natural highs info in the text. If I miss anything, D got it. So all of our contact info is right down there. And Libby, closing thoughts? Um, I just want to thank you, Angie, for doing this and putting it together. And, and I'm really impressed with D and Jasmine. I just think you guys are awesome. And I'm I hear from Ivani that you have requested a lot of people, or you're, you're working on getting more people trained for a Hacky Detox, which is very cool. So thank you. Ivani, closing thoughts, uh, and then I'll just say a couple things about the film and we'll head out. I just so moved that we got to collaborate here and that we got to come together. And I'm like dying. I wanna meet everybody in the audience and to see, because I know these issues go across all walks of life, all backgrounds, and this is our opportunity to come together to own this issue and to take this on as a village, and uh, not to give it up to you know uh, the pharmaceutical industry or any industry, uh, to basically bring that back home. And so I'm very moved and very inspired by this conversation. Uh, so wonderful, Angie, for you to bring world and so anything we can do we want to be a part of it thank you aaron last 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 words yeah no child is broken uh symptoms are results of, of systems and there's systemic failure affecting our children and no child can be responsible for fixing a system this is on the parents so we're gonna have to band together and do the work. Angie, thank you for your service to our country. Thank you for your service beyond your service to our country and continuing to serve our country with this work. It's so powerful and it's really been informing a big direction, not only in, in this podcast series, but in my life and in our treatment center. So thank you very much for what you've done. And when you roll through Colorado, me and Ivani are here in Boulder. We got I'm you, man. I want some of that food. I want some of that food we, to fire my <laughs> We got you. We got you. It's, no, it's but, here. So roll on. Thank you. But seriously, that's what we call in the military. It's called a force multiplier. Because we have to all talk to you all, you're going to go talk to other people. So if you educate one, you educate the village, you know? So I appreciate you saying that. Um, so just final thoughts about the film. We have screenings like this one all the time. Uh, we're scheduling now for spring. So if you know of another organization that you think would benefit from this program or hosting, uh, please just email us. It's medicatingnormal at gmail.com. And 
I always like to say, don't believe anything you heard. Don't believe anything we said. Let this be the beginning of your own journey to, to learning or unlearning anything that you've already learned. So uh, to help in that process, our website does have a reading list, uh, re research, everything in the, the film is evidence-based. There's a whole list of journal articles to read. Um, we have resources and alternatives and our YouTube channel has over 150 videos, small ones, short ones, panels like this one. And Facebook, we post articles every day on different subjects in the current mental health. So thank you all for coming. Avani, I feel like you're a soulmate. I, I've loved you since the moment I talked to you on the phone. It's like with some people you just know. Aaron is the same way. Now Jazz and Dee, you're like little sisters. Libby, you're amazing too. <laughs> thank you for all you do, all of you. I love this. This is one of my favorite panels. I'll never forget it. And I hope you all have a good night and love each other. That's all we can do, right? All right. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.